You're watching Final Fact to see 12. <laughs> 20 fast facts about Final Fantasy 12. I'm Peter. And I'm Nukwe. Make sure to subscribe for more facts and amazing Final Fantasy content. You won't regret it. And that's a fact. Fact number one! Did you know that the logo for Final Fantasy XII, featuring Judge Gabranth in all his vertical glory, was drawn by Yoshitaka Amano during the short time it took a representative from Square to come pick up the logo designs he had already made? Amano later described the iconic brush effect featured in the final version as something that could only come about spontaneously, and that the best logos aren't always created by strictly conforming to the client's request, making this a great example of thinking outside the Square. Fact number two! And speaking of Jessica Brath, did you know there was a disagreement between the original Japanese developers and the English translators? The disagreement centered around a scene near the beginning of the game where Gabrath murders the King of Rabanaster by pretending to be his own twin brother Bash. In the Japanese version, the voices of both Gabrath and Bash are played over one another, giving the scene a sort of dreamlike quality, but the translators opted for a more realistic sound for the English version by having Michael E. Rogers, the voice actor for Gabrath, simply mimicking or impersonating the voice of Bash. Eventually, the change was accepted, but it nevertheless represents a bold move on the part of the translators, as this sort of change is essentially a directorial decision. FACT NUMBER THREE! On the topic of the twins, did you know that Gabranth is actually the younger of the two, while Bash is the elder? This is never made explicit in the English version, but the order of their birth has always been stated in the original Japanese, adding yet another layer to their already complicated relationship. FACT NUMBER FOUR! And were you aware that Gabranth's real name is actually Noah Horn Ronsenberg? This is revealed in passing near the end of the game, but what is perhaps more interesting is that Gabranth is actually his mother's surname, which he adopted as he migrated with her to Arcadia, the imperial capital, in the aftermath of the Empire's attack on his homeland, the Republic of Landis, Bash, on the other hand, fleeing to the Kingdom of Dalmasca. Fact number five! And while on the subject of names, did you know that Balthier's middle name, Miet, his birth name being Famran Miet Bonanza, is a romanized spelling of Mido, or Mid, a recurring name for characters related to Sid in various Final Fantasy games. And of course, the name doesn't disappoint, since Balthier is in fact related to Dr. Sid in the game. Fact number six! And since it is impossible to get enough of Balthier, did you know that the game was intended to feature a flashback scene featuring a young Balthier? The Final Fantasy XII Ultimania Omega even features concept art for what he might have looked like. It also tells us that the model for the young Balthier was actually complete, noting that the quality of the textures of his glasses was especially great. Oh, what could have been? A young, sexy Balthier with glasses. Yes, please. Fact, Fact number seven. seven! And speaking of sexy things! Did you know that Final Fantasy XII once held the Guinness World Record for the longest development time for a video game, spanning the better part of five years from when development began in 2001 until it was released in 2006? <laughs> <laughs> it might not look like much now, especially considering it took approximately 10 years to make Final Fantasy XV, but once upon a time, this was enough to put a game in the record books. Oh, how the times have changed! Fact number eight! Another record the game missed out on was having the first director to get two perfect scores for the Japanese video game magazine Famitsu. Originally, Final Fantasy XII was directed by Yasumi Matsuno, who had previously directed games such as Final Fantasy Tactics and Vagrant Story, and Hiroyuki Ito, the creator of the Active Time Battle System and the director of Final Fantasy VI and IX, among other things. Matsuno's Vagrant Story had previously been awarded with a perfect Famitsu score, a prestigious 40 out of 40, being the third video game ever to be afforded that honor. However, Matsuno had to step down as the director of Final Fantasy XII due to health reasons before the game was released and subsequently awarded with the same honor. Of course, we don't know whether Final Fantasy XII would have gotten a perfect score if Matsuno had stayed on as the game's director, but it is a testament to his work as a game developer that two of his games have received recognition in this way. Fact number nine! Final Fantasy XII and Vagrant Story are both a part of the Evilis Alliance, a series of games that all take place in the fictional universe of Evilis, created by Matsuno. Final Fantasy Tactics being the first game to feature Evilis as a setting, although in the official chronology of the games themselves, Final Fantasy XII is actually where the story begins, as the game is set in the relatively distant past. 
However, what's more interesting is that Matsuno himself doesn't appear to really consider Vacant Story a part of the world of Evilis, despite various in-game connections, instead choosing to think of such references as fan service or easter eggs for those who had played Final Fantasy Tactics. Matsuno nevertheless notes that Square, now Square Enix, the publisher of the game, is entitled to see things differently. And since Vacant Story is generally thought to belong to the Evilis Alliance, it raises questions as who gets to decide what is canon and what isn't. Is it the creator, the publisher, or maybe even the fans? You came here for facts, but we left you with questions. Fact number, number 10. 10! Apart from still being credited with the story and concept for Final Fantasy XII, Matsuno's presence can also be felt in a tribute to him in the form of the optional superboss Yasmat, the name being a play on his name, Yasumi Matsuno. Yasmat is endowed with over 50 million hit points, which means that it can actually take several hours to kill this gigantic beast, especially in the original version of the game, since unlike the later Zodiac versions, it didn't include the break damage ability, capping most damage at a measly 9999 HP. One of our fondest memories of playing the original Final Fantasy XII is actually setting up gambits for the party and going out to see a film while the game continued to play itself automatically. Then, when we returned a couple of hours later, we were surprised to see Yasmat still alive and kicking. Incidentally, Yasmi Matsuno himself is also still alive and kicking, so hopefully he's in good health. Fact, Fact number 11. 11! And speaking of the gambit system, Final Fantasy XII represented a departure from many of the norms of the series. The biggest one arguably being the implementation of the Active Dimension battle system, which eliminated random encounters and instead had battles take place out in the field. One of the driving forces behind the system was the Gambit system, which allowed players to pre-program how they wanted characters in the game to respond to different situations. Interestingly enough, Ito, who continued directing the game even after Matsuno had stepped down, has explained that the Gambit system was actually partly inspired by American football, as he drew inspirations for Gambits from plays in the NFL. The idea was that team members all have a specific job to do based on the conditions they are faced with and the desired outcomes of each play. This means that Final Fantasy XII is probably the closest we'll ever get to playing American football. Fact number 12! Yet another innovation by Ito was the license board, which featured hundreds of unlockable tiles, each one corresponding to particular stats, abilities or equipment. Although the game was originally planned to feature a more classic Final Fantasy job system, the idea was discarded since the developers thought it might be too overwhelming to pair it with the already complicated new Gambit system. Instead, Ito wanted to create a system which gave players a lot of freedom to develop their characters any way they saw fit. However, instead of customizing their characters in unique ways, players ended up just acquiring every license without really differentiating between the characters as the developers had hoped. I guess the problem with freedom is freedom. Back Fight number 13! 13. Noticing that players were reluctant to commit to certain types of roles when given a choice, the developers returned to the original idea of using a job system for the reworked version of the game. Up until that point, several Final Fantasy games had received so-called international versions, which incorporated changes made while preparing the game for international release. However, for Final Fantasy XII, Ito wanted to do something bigger by making more significant changes to the version of Final Fantasy XII that had already made its way around the world. Originally, Ito wanted to call the game Final Fantasy XII Annex, but due to limited resources, he wasn't able to make all the changes he wanted to. Seeing as the biggest difference was the new job system, the new version of the game ended up being called Final Fantasy XII International Zodiac Job System. The international part no doubt being added to better associate it with the previous definitive titles, using the same name. This was the basis for Final Fantasy XII The Zodiac Age, which is the version of the game that is available today. Having finally implemented the job system, players would feel the weight of their choices as they couldn't switch jobs once they had assigned them, giving their choices a real sense of finality. Fact number 14! One way the Zodiac versions of the game did away with finality, however, was by abolishing forbidden chests. In the original Final Fantasy XII, the contents of most treasure chests used to be random as the developers hoped to instill a feeling of fate in players and an appreciation for what they got. Although it didn't exactly play out like that, since just like with the license board, Ito noticed that players just started saving and restarting the game if they didn't get what they wanted. Later, the first Zodiac version scrapped the idea of random treasures altogether and brought the total number of chests from 923 to 1,676 in order to accommodate all the different jobs. 
The Zodiac version also eliminated the idea of forbidden chests, which was a set of chests strewn about the game world that looked just like any other chests. The only difference was that if you ended up opening one of them, you would never be able to claim the Zodiac Spear, the most powerful weapon in the original game. There weren't that many forbidden chests, but knowing they were out there meant that it often just felt safer to leave chests alone completely. That is until you got the chance to make an underleveled suicide run into the necro hall of Nabudis to claim the Zodiac Spear. Ah, uh, good times. <coughs> back Fact number 15. 15! Another way Final Fantasy XII changed up the Final Fantasy formula was by incorporating a different world aesthetic. Where in past Final Fantasy games had taken place in worlds inspired by traditional medieval fantasy, science fiction, and even Southeast Asia, Final Fantasy XII took inspiration from places such as the Mediterranean, with the art team actually visiting Turkey for inspiration. Other notable points of reference were India and even New York. Hideo Minoba and Isamu Kami Kokuryo, the art director for the game, noticing that they wanted to present the players with a variety of influences, in contrast to Final Fantasy X, where a spear of the game world was presented as more of a unified whole. You're a unified whole. <laughs> in this way, it's possible to imagine that the bustling metropolis of Arcades might have been at least partly inspired by New York. At the same time, the Indian inspiration in the sky city of Bajerba is plain to see, as loan words from Sanskrit are prominently used by the people there. Right, 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 right. Did you know that even though the Japanese version of Final Fantasy XII didn't feature notable accents for different groups, with everyone speaking in standard Japanese, the English localization team opted to use different speeds to illustrate the different cultures of Ivalice. However, even though the inspiration for Bajerba was notably Indian, the localization team opted for Sri Lankan accents instead of the stereotypical Indian accent. This way, they hoped to depict Bujerba as a foreign land that had been colonized by an empire, not only in terms of the story, but also in a way that built on a real-world history of language and colonization. Another way they incorporated the use of different accents into the game was by deciding to give Fran, the Viera, an Icelandic accent, giving their speech a quote-unquote unusual alien quality, intended to mimic the speech of Icelandic singer Björk. Ultimately, Fran and the Viera didn't end up sounding Icelandic at all, but as the Viera made a triumphant return in Final Fantasy XIV, they all had explicitly Icelandic accents, making them sound something like this. So if anyone from the Final Fantasy XIV team is watching, please consider casting us as Viera in the future. <laughs> Fight number 18! Speaking of the Viera, there are a total of 31 Viera the player can speak to in the game. What's more, if players speak to them with Fran as the active party leader, they give different responses than they would if approached by any other member of the party. However, this is only possible outside of town areas, since Van is the default party leader when entering settlements. Fact number 19! Looking at the concept artwork of Van by Akihiko Yoshita, we can see that at one point during development, he was actually known as Aqua, making his name feel more at home with the Final Fantasy naming conventions, which brought us the likes of Squall and Cloud, and later on Lightning and Noctis, all of them being named after some element or phenomena found in nature. In addition to having his name changed to Van, the character underwent many evolutions during the game's long development which, just in case you forgot, became a world record at the time. After starting out as a fairly rugged character, he was rewritten to be more effeminate to appeal to the game's target demographic in Japan, which has a history of rejecting overly rough and masculine main characters. However, when Kohei Takeda was cast for both Van's motion capture and voice acting, Van once again became a little bit less feminine as Takeda brought a bit more assertiveness and energy to the role than had been intended. The last fact is reserved to challenge what many have come to believe as fact, and that is the idea that Van was a last-minute addition to the game, which the developers were forced to include in order to appeal to the game's target demographic. This urban legend has proved very resilient, most likely due to the fact that Van isn't the most popular Final Fantasy protagonist around, and because his role in the story appears to be relatively small. Looking back, however, we can see that Van was featured front and center when the game was revealed all the way back in 2003, which means that he must have been an integral part of the game from very early on. Considering that Matsuno stayed on as director until the latter half of 2005, 
it is also safe to assume that Van was a part of Matsuno's vision for the game. Of course, it is possible to imagine that the higher-ups at Square pushed for Van in favor of a more rugged character like Bash, but the time frame suggests that Van has been with the game in one form or another from very early on, with the game starting development in 2001 and Van being made the original poster boy for it in 2003. You might have issues with Van, but time shouldn't be one of them. Well, goodbye. Well, thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe. Bye. Bye. <laughs>